Hello, I'm Dr. Randall Seacrest, your host for eOrthopod TV. Today I have as my guest Dr. Ty Tyondon. Dr. Tyondon finished his medical school training at the University of California, San Francisco. From there, he completed a neurosurgical residency at Yale. He completed a complex, minimally invasive spine fellowship at Cedar sinai in Los Angeles. Today, Dr. Tyondon is the director of the Neurosurgical Spine Center at University of California, Irvine. Good morning, Dr. Tyondon. Good morning, Randy. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us. T today, what I would like to do is discuss uh, a common problem in neurosurgery, which is neck pain. Uh, I'm sure as a neurosurgeon you see a, a significant number of patients who present to your office with neck pain. Right. What do you start with when you see that patient? What's the first thing you do with those patients? Well, you know, neck pain is um, actually one of the most common uh, presenting uh, complaints that we see uh, patients coming into our clinic with. Um, the initial assessment uh, for patients with neck pain really involves taking a detailed history. Uh, going back, um, asking the patient uh, what brings on the pain, what aggravates the pain, what makes the pain better. Um, does the pain shoot down uh, their arms? Is it just isolated to their neck, a condition we call axial neck pain? Um, and the initial, so the initial evaluation of that condition begins with taking a very detailed history. That history then sort of leads you into uh, performing a very focused physical. Mm -hmm. now, now, when you're talking about a difference between pain that is, is actually in nature, I think you put it, pain right in the middle of the neck, versus pain that goes down the arm, what's the significance of that? It, um, it gives uh, me as a physician that's evaluating a patient an idea of what, where the pathology lies um, in the neck. Um, it, uh, uh, when, when a patient comes in and complains of neck pain, you know, the questions that are going through my head are, is it coming from the vertebral body? Is there some sort of compression on the nerve roots uh, that are exiting uh, from the, uh, from the uh, cervical spine, from the neck? Is there compression of the spinal cord? Mm. Um, and those, uh, those uh, questions that into like, are, is there pain radiating down in someone's arm? Is it just isolated to the neck? Are there like other signs and symptoms that lead to uh, forming a diagnosis and then selecting an appropriate treatment? Well, w once you're finished with the history, and, and you're, I think you've already mentioned a couple of things. One is, is the things you're looking at with the patient are where's the pain and, and how long has it been there and what's, what's causing it, what's bringing it on, what's making it better. Any other things you're looking for as a, nurse, a neurosurgeon that would tip you off to whether this is something to be concerned with from the patient standpoint or whether this is, is pretty typical neck pain that we, most of us are going to get some, at some point in our lives. So, you know, one of the key things um, that I look for um, in evaluating uh, these patients is are there any motor or sensory uh, changes? You know, any, uh, is there any muscle weakness uh, in the arms? You know, that can be a sign of compression of, uh, of nerve roots. Um, is there any hyper, what we call hyperreflexia? That's a condition that, uh, it's a, it's a symptom that um, leads, uh, leads us to suspect that there may be compression of uh, the spinal cord. Is the patient having any difficulty walking? Even though like, the, you know, the condition may deal with uh, uh, the patient's neck, it can actually affect uh, an individual's legs. Are there any bowel bladder problems? It's a very, um, for, for a very common and sometimes, it's, uh, sometimes simple complaint, it can actually have a whole host of uh, manifestations. Um, of, of symptoms and uh, I think that's why especially with neck pain it's very critical uh, for a patient to sit down with this uh, physician and uh, sort of go through a very detailed history. Mm -hmm. Now it, it's interesting that you mentioned reflexes because a lot of patients come into the office and, and um, they're confused I think about what we're looking for when we're, we're testing reflexes and that sort of thing and I've, I've seen a lot of patients who come in and say well, you know my reflexes are very good thinking the the, the more powerful the reflex, the better off they are. And I think what I've just heard you say is in some cases that's not, that's not the case. D describe for patients what, what you as a neurosurgeon, how you use reflexes to really decide what's going on and what information that tells you. Right. Um, you know, the, the reflexes in conjunction with a, a lot of other uh, symptoms, are, are, it's very similar to when you start your car. There's a check engine light, there's a, a lot of um, different uh, lights that light up and tell you if there's something wrong or something that's not quite right. The car may still be running, but there may be something out of tune. Uh, re checking the, the reflexes um, are an indication of, of how, uh, how like, well-tuned the spinal cord may be in, re in relation to is it being compressed. 
reflexes that are brisk, you know, a lot of people may say I have good reflexes, but that may actually be an indication of uh, some sort of pathology in which the uh, spinal cord is being compressed. Um, so we look for hyperreflexia. In addition, we look for hyporeflexia, which is like abnormal or decreased um, uh, reflexes, which may also be an indication of uh, compression of uh, nerve roots or the uh, or chronic compression of the uh, spinal cord. Mm. So it's not necessarily the, the the reflex one reflex itself. It's the it's the quality of the reflex and then the and then the interpretation. Right, and the of symmetry. The, the symmetry of reflexes is uh, is the, the reflex different on the right side as it, as it as it is on the left side that can help will lead to isolation where the pathology may be coming from. Mm. Now you also mentioned another thing I think is very important and that is you know we always watch the patient walk. I mean it, most orthopedic surgeons and, and neurosurgeons are very interested in watching how a patient walks. Explain for patients why that's important. Um, it's, it's important because it gives us um, an idea of how well the neural axis is doing. Um, the, re the impulse for, uh, a patient to for a person to walk starts in the brain, goes down the spinal cord, down to the nerves and the legs, uh, which then stimulate the muscles to walk. That's a, sort of an, a simplified uh, overview. But uh, any sort of uh, uh, abnormality along that pathway can affect a, a patient's ability to walk. Patients that have chronic compression of their spinal cord may have a wide base gait. And uh, it's sort of, uh, it's slowly progressive over time. A lot of patients may not even pick up on that because it's so slow. But when they walk into your office, um, it's one of the things that you can kind of clearly see as they walk in through the door. Um, a lot of them, a lot of patients, uh, depending on uh, where, again, where, the, uh, where they're having problems, may, uh, may have an abnormal uh, walking pattern due to, like, numbness in their feet or weakness as well. And those are all clues uh, that help us as physicians uh, figure out where the problem may be. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, I, I get a lot of patients who are elderly, and obviously a lot of elderly patients uh, have these problems that we're discussing, the, the, the problem with the, the spinal cord pressure and the wide base gait. And a lot of them just sort of think it's part of getting older. So they, they have this problem with their balance, and they come in and they don't think much of it, and they just sort of attribute it to age. And I think what I hear you saying, and what I'm usually telling patients, is that, yes, yeah, some of that's okay, some of it. But, but when I start to see that, I start thinking about what's going on with this person, and is this just re age-related, or is this coming from something that's correctable? Yeah, you know, that's a, that's a great point, because a lot of people will come into the office saying, oh, I'm just getting older, that's why I'm walking this way. And, you know, that is true, because as you get older, your spine also ages. And uh, with an aging spine, there's certain things that may happen that make that walking pattern uh, develop as you get older. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes, it may be a sign of, you know, of an aging spine, and a lot of people sort of uh, push it away, um, uh, sort of sort of say, you know, I'm just getting older. But it may also be a sign of something a little bit more serious that needs to be checked out. Mm -hmm. And it's potentially correctable. I that's think correct. Is, is, the, is the real thing is, is those folks don't necessarily have to put up with that. It's that's not correct. part of getting older. Um, once you've gotten what you think is is a, an acceptable history, and you you have a pretty good idea of of what's going on with the patient, and you've completed a physical exam, what's next? I mean, what test do you generally rely on as a neurosurgeon to clarify your diagnosis? So with each step of the way, you're sort of honing down a decision process. You, have a, you make sort of a broad um, diag a diagnosis, initial diagnosis, saying, OK, this person has something going on with either their neck, the middle of their back, or their lower back. Um, you use the physical exam to sort of narrow that down a little bit, saying, OK, it's, it's in their neck, but it's affecting. Uh, possibly these nerve roots or the spinal cord, and based on that, you, as a as myself as a as a as a neurosurgical spine surgeon, sort of decides what uh, test modality, what sort of test to order. Um, and there's a whole host of different tests. Uh, the initial imaging studies may involve just plain X-rays, uh, which kind of give you an overview of what the general condition of the uh, spine may be at that point. Something a little bit better than a x-rays uh, that may yield a little bit more useful information about the bony anatomy and the structures of the bone and the state of the bone uh, are CT scans. Um, if we need to look uh, a little bit more specifically at nerve roots, uh, there's uh, MRIs um, that are available uh, that give you a very clear picture of the nerve roots, the, uh, the spinal cord. Um, another study that we commonly use are CT myelograms, which are uh, very similar to uh, to the type of information that you yield from a CT scan, but we have an added component of being able to look at the nerve roots uh, that are exiting, and it gives you a very uh, 
uh, nice picture of the way that the bones are interacting with the uh, nerve roots. Uh, those are sort of the most commonly employed imaging modalities. There's also electrical tests that we can do. Uh, we have the ability now to, uh, to uh, electrically stimulate nerves and muscle groups and see how those are working along the uh, pathway from the uh, spinal cord down to uh, their end target, the muscles. Mm -hmm. Now, a couple of questions about that. You know, I, th I think patients are always confused about, and, may, and some physicians are confused about when, when a CAT scan, for example, is very useful and when an MRI scan is more useful. What, what are your thoughts? Do you normally order both of these tests in neck pain patients or do you do one versus the other? Yeah. There's a lot of uh, controversy um, on what type of, uh, uh, of test order um, at a specific point. Initially, uh, you, you, there's a uh, clinical um, gestalt as to what's going on. If you think uh, that there's a bony problem, if it's a mechanical in nature, um, and uh, after getting an initial um, x-ray, if you think you need a little bit more detailed anatomy about the bony anatomy, a CT scan mm -hmm. uh, would be uh, an appropriate uh, test. It gives you a very nice look at the, at the bone, the bony, the calcified bony, bony uh, structures. And MRI um, is a useful test if you suspect compression of a nerve root um, or compression, or compression of, uh, of, um, of, of the spinal cord or, or, or a problem with the ligaments. It gives you a very good detailed picture of the soft tissue. Um, so based on what your clinical suspicion is about what's going on, um, you may favor ordering a CT scan versus an MRI. Some patients get both because they may have both a, a couple different processes going on that may involve both their bones in, in, in their spine and also the, uh, the, the nerve roots and the spinal cord and soft tissues. Now one other question that, that I'm always confused with and that is when do you think it's appropriate to actually um, when do you think a, a test such as a CT myelogram, where you actually have to put dye into the spinal canal in order to show the nerves, a test we used to do lots before the MRI scan and before the CAT scan, but now I, know, I notice that a lot of neurosurgeons really like to see a CT myelogram with dye in that, in that spinal space so that they can really delineate fine things. When do you, when do you resort to that test? Right. There's, um, there's actually been a resurgence in using CT myelograms, uh, like you were saying. Um, it has a very um, high utility in redo spine surgeries, um, you know, where you want to see what effects uh, some of the soft tissues and bones are having on the exiting nerve roots. It's also very useful um, in looking at very detailed uh, anatomy of, uh, of the neural foramina. That's the space where the nerve roots exit. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, it gives you a very clear idea, too, of any specific points where there might be a compression on the spinal cord. You may be able to see sort of generalized uh, compression of the spinal cord on MRI, but if you really want to kind of get a very specific detailed look um, at what points uh, may be uh, specifically involved with CT myelogram would probably be a good test. Uh, in some, some patients, it's a, it's a little bit more sensitive, believe it or not, than an MRI, which traditionally we've associated as the latest high technology. Uh, um, diagnostic uh, test, um, but uh, again, it needs to be used. It, usually, it's used in conjunction with uh, with an MRI, and those uh, bits of information from both tests are put together to uh, to really get um, a very accurate picture of what's going on. Do, do you think that the more the more powerful the, the MRI scan magnets become, and the better the software that that will eventually see an MRI scan that gives you that level of detail and Absolutely. eliminates. So you Absolutely. think it Yeah, there's um there's actually software available now where you could do an MRI myelogram, which is a which is a calculated uh, image uh, which is an image that's very similar to a CT myelogram. Mm -hmm. um, the way that the technology exists right now, it's still not as good as a traditional CT myelogram, but it definitely provides uh, valuable information. And I think as the MRI magnets get more powerful, our ability to see the detail and better clarity is, uh, will, will, be, uh, will be improved, and I think it's definitely going to be a very powerful and useful tool. And that won't require any sort of spinal tap or dye into the That's space. That's correct. That's so, correct. So no needle sticks. That's in. Sometimes um, with certain MRIs, uh, the test, uh, the physician will order an MRI with contrast. Um, and that involves uh, just an intravenous injection of, uh, of, uh, of a dye through an IV, and that involves a very small stick, but it's not the, uh, the, the type of uh, invasive procedure that you would need for a CT myelogram where needles actually passed into uh, your back and dye is injected directly into, uh, 
the uh, fluid spaces around the spinal cord. Mm -hmm. Now, one other test that we haven't discussed, and I'd like your opinion on that, and that's a bone scan. Do you find bone scans very useful in the cervical spine? Um, in the cervical spine, not so much. Um, for certain uh, pathologies, they do yield very uh, useful uh, information. Um, a bone scan um, is basically, in a simplified version, is sort of an indication of what sort of uh, hot spots in the body um, are lighting up. Where is the body sort of actively remodeling? What's, is there a lot of metabolic activity uh, happening in a particular location? Um, and that kind of gives you a view into uh, areas that may be undergoing active uh, bony remodeling. Is there, it's very useful in tumors uh, where there's uh, tumor, tumor growth that may be uh, speckled through the, uh, the uh, vertebral bodies. Um, in the right patient uh, with the right pathology, I think it yields uh, some information. It's good for assessing uh, uh, patients where there may be a, a suspicion for what's called pseudoarthrosis in patients that have undergone spinal fusion. Um, if uh, there's a suspicion that, that it hasn't quite fused yet, it gives you an accurate, um, uh, it gives you very, uh, very um, useful information about whether there's an active healing process uh, trying to happen there that can uh, uh, let the physician know that, you know, maybe this hasn't completely fused, uh, you know, a part of the uh, spine hasn't completely fused yet. Mm. Um, it's, a, it's a useful tool um, in the right patient, um, but uh, it may not be the right uh, diagnostic uh, choice for just a general patient walking in with, uh, with neck pain. Yeah, so most neck pain patients that just come in, and, you know, they've had neck pain for maybe six, six months and it's just not going away and their primary care provider has finally said, you know, I don't know what's going on, you you continue to have neck pain, it's not getting better with conservative treatment, maybe some physical therapy, maybe the patient has been seeing a chiropractor. The most common test you would order as a first test would be x-rays? X-rays, And then maybe an MRI scan? Yeah, an x-ray actually is a very good first step. Um, a lot of people think that with an x-ray you get a static uh, image of, uh, of the neck, but in actuality you can have a patient flex, bend their neck, extend their neck, rotate, and uh, you get x-rays um, uh, of, uh, of the neck in various positions, and uh, that gives you some useful information about how the bones are interacting with each other, how the joints are interacting with each other, mm. um, and that's a very good uh, uh, starting point. Do you ever just see patients and don't do any imaging and essentially begin treatment without any imaging? Um, absolutely, especially like uh, if patients come in that, um, in my opinion, haven't had adequate conservative therapy. Mm -hmm. um, the way that I view surgery is it's really an option of, uh, of last resort for a lot of patients or, uh, or it's an option where you have a very clear pathology that you know you can go in and fix and have like a very high, um, high rate of success. Uh, for most patients uh, that walk in off the street saying that I have, you know, saying that they have neck pain, um, the common questions that I would ask are, have you gone through physical therapy? Um, have we uh, tried uh, some neck exercises that, you know, may help with some of the musculoskeletal components of, uh, of neck pain? Um, have we tried some medications that help with, uh, with uh, neck pain um, to see if, you know, that sort of gets them back to a level where they say, hey, I can go on and live my life. You know, I don't really need to do much more. Um, of this, and it really depends on uh, the condition of the patient when they walk in. Uh, it depends on the age. I think that's a, a very significant factor in deciding what you want to do mm. uh, with the patient and uh, how severely their condition is affecting the quality of their life. Now, let's, let's move on a little bit and, and look at some of the causes of neck pain. And when you're at this point where you've evaluated a patient, and let's say this patient has axial neck pain, you know, the pain where it's hurting in your neck, you're not having any sort of neurological symptoms, either uh, pain down the arms or anything that you would think represents any sort of spinal cord compression. I mean, what's causing the pain in, the, in that patient's instance? What, what are the structures that really are what we would consider pain generators? Yeah. So axial neck pain is actually a very complicated uh, problem. It's a, and treating it is a very controversial um, issue in spine surgery. Um, for the most part, when patients complain of axial neck pain, it really involves some sort of mechanical motion of, uh, of the uh, spinal column, the bones, the joints um, that, uh, that are perceived as, as pain. Um, they can be from uh, the joints in the back, which we call facets. Um, it could be from an aging spine where you have, uh, uh, have uh, bone that's uh, rubbing against bone. It could be from disc degeneration, uh, what we call uh, degenerative disc disease. 
uh, and all of these could be perceived by a patient as pain in my neck. Uh, so it's a very uh, complicated uh, issue and uh, it's, uh, it's one of those uh, conditions in, in spine surgery where I think a lot of tests are warranted like getting an MRI, um, doing a nerve block or facet blocks to see if those joints um, are really causing, uh, causing pain. Um, and uh, I think uh, the, the, in, in that case the workup actually becomes very critical because you want to pinpoint um, the uh, source or sources of, uh, of a patient's uh, neck pain. Uh, because it sort of gives you the ability to hone down a treatment plan that's, uh, that, be that becomes very effective. Now, you know, it's, it's common to see patients who, ha who come in with uh, a conception or, or a, maybe even a misperception that they've had some sort of a cervical strain, which is a common diagnosis that people say. So they sort of come in assuming that, well, I, I've, I've, I've strained something. And, and normally they think that they've strained a muscle, so it's, it's muscles causing pain in the neck. I mean, what are your thoughts on that? It sounds like we're moving into an era where people are trying to be a little more exact and not sort of just give people this blanket diagnosis of a cervical strain. We didn't right. really know what that meant. Yeah, uh, cervical strain can actually be a symptom of some other process that's going on. It may be nothing more than just simply a muscle strain, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, but it could also be a symptom of some other process that's going on in the neck in which the muscles of your neck are trying to compensate uh, for uh, either a weak joint uh, uh, or uh, some sort of instability um, in the neck. Mm. Um, and uh, a lot of uh, p patients will come in saying, you know, it feels really sore, uh, you know, it feels, it feels like I have a knot, I get headaches uh, from, uh, from, you know, p this pain that starts in my neck. And uh, it really may be an indication of some deeper lying problem. Um, and uh, it, uh, you know, when you do walk into a physician's office, it sort of guides them into uh, uh, sort of finding a diagnosis with uh, what may be going on. You know, it's, it's really an indication to look a little bit deeper, mm -hmm. I think, and you want to rule out a lot of uh, other pathologies that may be causing. Right. So let me get this straight. I think, I think what I hear you saying, and I, I, I probably agree with this, a lot of patients come in and they think they have muscle strain, muscle cramps, muscle spasms, uh, whatever they perceive is going on. And I think what you're saying is that, yeah, you do have muscle spasms, but that's not the problem. The problem is, is that, for example, you've got arthritis of your, of your facet joints or you've got a degenerative disc that's not, that spinal segment's not working right. So those muscles are working overtime to try to compensate or try to, try to stabilize that. And as they work overtime, they actually begin to hurt. That's correct. But if you correct the underlying problem, the muscle spasm goes away. That's correct. That's correct. So okay. I think it's really important when a patient does come in complaining of that to look a little bit deeper and rule out some of the other processes that may be causing that. Not just assume that it's the muscles causing the problem and here's some muscle relaxants and go home and you'll be fine. That's correct. Now, let's move on in terms of treatment. If you've got that patient who um, you feel like is, 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 is suffering from axial neck pain, does not have any dangerous pathology that requires immediate um, attention, such as surgery, injections, or anything like that, where do you normally start and what is your treatment protocol for axial neck pain? Do you send that person to a physical therapist? Do you treat them with medications? Do you give them some exercises to do? What should that patient look forward to? My, uh, my philosophy on that uh, tends to be a little bit more on the conservative side. I think you know, what you want to do with those patients um, is is sort of treat them with exercises, refer them to a physical therapist uh, that has uh, some special expertise in treating uh, neck pain. Uh, maybe start them on a course of anti-inflammatory uh, medications, the non anti-inflammatory medications to see if that has some improvement. Um, my experience has been about 30% will, will improve uh, with that, with sort of that conservative treatment. Um, if that fails, then there are some other treatment modalities that we consider, but you really want to try uh, treating the patient with uh, the, most, uh, the least invasive uh, procedures that you have uh, available to uh, address these problems to see if there's any improvement to a point where they say, hey, you know, I'm okay now, or I'm okay now to the point that I can continue with uh, doing what I do with my life, you know, mm. without it impacting it too much. How long do you think you should give axial neck pain. I mean, so if I go to a physical therapist as a patient and I work with a physical therapist for a month, six weeks, is that enough? Is, is that normally when you would say this is not working? Or when should a patient say, you know, this is not working? I think um, it's really variable on the patient. Traditionally, um, 
what a lot of surgeons, including myself, will uh, do is send a patient out for about a six-week uh, treatment course. You see them back in clinic, and you ask them, are you getting better? If they are, it may warrant continuing the therapy for a little bit longer. If they're not, then uh, you may uh, want to consider uh, other options at that point. So at some point during the course of the treatment, you sort of want to say, hey, let's, let's do a check and see how you're doing. Is this helping? And if it is, uh, you know, you would consider continu uh, continuing the, uh, that course of treatment. Mm -hmm. Do you see, you mentioned anti-inflammatory medications for pain relief and that sort of thing. Any other medications that you find are useful in axial neck pain patients that benefit them in the, in, in the short term and, and possibly in the long term? Yeah, so in addition to the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications, you can treat the muscle spasms that we were talking about before with the anti, uh, anti medications that's, uh, that um, uh, sort of quiet those spasms down. Um, you get, in our facility at UC Irvine, we work in conjunction with the pain management um, physician, and uh, we may consider doing uh, sort of uh, injections, blocks of the uh, joints themselves, nerve blocks, if there is any sort of pain uh, associated with the nerve. Those are all, uh, you know, a combination of different treatments that we could use. Um, in addition, um, not so much in the neck, uh, but it, it may have a utility. There's uh, stimulators uh, that may help massage the muscles a little bit that uh, some patients have uh, found some benefit. And, and another uh, popular thing these days is acupuncture. Do you think acupuncture is a useful modality for axial neck pain? Um, you know, my philosophy on that is uh, if patients are getting a benefit from that, I really don't have a problem with that. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, there are some patients that uh, seem to get some relief from it. Um, I think the uh, key thing to, uh, for a patient to realize is, is that if you are going through acupuncture and nothing's getting better, it may be, a t may be a time to see a, a specialist. Okay. And no risk to acupuncture for patients with... Generally not. Yeah. It's, gen it's generally a safe, uh, safe procedure. Mm -hmm. um, Let's move on and talk a little bit about when you make the decision that conservative care is not working. I mean, what are the things that tip you off that, you know, what we're doing is not working, you're not getting any better, and we need to proceed on to invasive options? And you mentioned injections. Um, when do you stop conservative care and begin to recommend that maybe the pain the patient needs to see a pain physician and consider some of the more invasive options? Generally, um, I, the conservative uh, therapy and pain management um, with my patients sort of happen simultaneously. Um, there's an initial referral to a physical therapist. Um, and I'll also, also ask the patient on what their preference may be. Do you want to see a pain specialist at the same time? Uh, some will say yes, some will say I just want to try out the uh, physical therapy. Um, and so both those modalities tend to happen simultaneously. There are some patients where um, they'll come in after physical therapy and that sort of fails and I'll still sort of think that they're uh, not uh, good candidates for a surgical procedure and refer them to a pain specialist to see if uh, they can get some benefit uh, from, uh, from injections. Um, and uh, you know, a certain subgroup of those patients will, will get uh, some benefit. Uh, from that. Um, the question about uh, when do you operate on a patient, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very complicated one. Um, the issues that uh, guide my practice in deciding um, when a patient should go to the operating room are, are there any motor or sensory deficits uh, that I can fix? Mm -hmm. uh, is the pain, if in case of pain, is the pain affecting the quality of life to a point that, you know, we need to do something about this? Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, the uh, the, and, the, and that undergoing a procedure has a high likelihood of, uh, of uh, at least alleviating a, a lot of their pain. Um, those are all sort of uh, uh, factors that, uh, that you know, I would consider in uh, deciding uh, when a patient should go. And it's, it's not just a decision that I make. I think it really involves a very um, deep understanding of what your patient wants, you know, uh, who your patient uh, is. You know, kind of, uh, it involves a very you know, uh, long, heartfelt discussion with the patient. Um, you know, asking them, you know, how do you, how, how should we proceed? It's really a collaborative uh, um, decision-making uh, process. Now, in, in patients that, that you see on a day-to-day -day basis with neck pain, um, what do you think are some of the common, I would say, mistakes these patients make in terms of their treatment? Um, over-treatment, under-treatment, waiting too long, 
Uh, any advice to those patients about some things they might not want to do or might want to avoid? I think um, the, the, the most common uh, uh, thing that I see is that patients um, sort of uh, fail to see in a, a specialist uh, until, it's, uh, until their conditions have sort of progressed a little bit. Um, if, uh, if you do have neck pain and you're having some symptoms, it's the safest thing to do is just go see a specialist. You know, go to a primary care physician or have them refer you to a, a spine specialist. Have it checked out. Mm -hmm. um, it never hurts to gather some information. Um, and I think, uh, I think a lot of patients, uh, a lot of people will wait, you know, until, hey doc, you know, I have, uh, they'll come in and say, hey doc, you know, I noticed some weakness in my hand, I noticed some problems walking, um, there's some numbness, there's some pain that's shooting down my arm. Um, and I think most people would benefit from an early diagnosis and uh, at least enrollment in physical therapy or, uh, you know, an early evaluation at that point. Mm. Uh, so going back to those, that that earlier statement that we had where um, the elderly patients, a, a very common population that has neck pain, those patients tend to attribute their problems to aging and things they're just going to have to put up with. And they should not necessarily consider this something that they're just going to have to put up with. Yeah. You know, the, the, the analogy that I draw, and I think more people are um, familiar with this, like if you're having chest pain, most people wouldn't want to get that checked out no matter how, like if, you know, if it's just a little bit of chest pain, it's chest pain when I walk. Um, you know, the, it's, it's very similar to the spine. If you're having pain when you're doing certain activities, maybe you should have that checked out. It, it, it definitely wouldn't hurt to at least, you know, get the opinion of a, a specialist on what may be going on. Mm -hmm. Um, it, you know, it may be uh, something that could be treated conservatively, maybe nothing. It's just, I think, a safer uh, bet to go ahead and have, uh, have that checked out. Well, it's been a wonderful discussion about neck pain from a neurosurgical standpoint. And I think that, that I've clearly learned a few things and I hope the patients that are watching have. Do you have any closing comments on neck pain and the, and the current state of our ability to diagnose and treat neck pain? that you think patients ought to be aware of? I think, um, yeah, absolutely. You know, it's, it's um, spine surgery is something that's changing almost on a monthly uh, basis. There's a lot of new technologies uh, that are uh, coming out. There's artificial discs, there's traditional surgery, there's pain management. Um, there's uh, facilities uh, that are now uh, uh, popping up that approach a patient from a holistic standpoint from both the neurosurgical, the orthopedic, and pain management uh, side. I think, um, the uh, key thing for uh, patients to uh, people to understand is if they are having neck pain that uh, that there are probably things that we could do to help them um, and uh, there's a lot of new treatment modalities that uh, they may not be aware of and it definitely probably would be um, up to their benefit to have you know come in at least you know talk to a uh, specialist uh, mm -hmm. about it and uh, see what uh, what options they may have. So if I can paraphrase that, and most of us start, I think, with our primary care provider, whether we perceive that that's a family practitioner, our general internist, or even in some cases with, with neck problems, our chiropractor. I think what you're suggesting is that if you're not getting better and that practitioner, no matter who he is, can't sort of reassure you with confidence that this is something that uh, you just need to continue to live with, that you should really sort of start questioning that and asking yourself and asking your practitioner, when is it appropriate for me to see a spine specialist and could you make that referral absolutely. And, and, and get that process started? Yeah, absolutely. I definitely think, and I think most practitioners would be happy to make that referral. Um, it's just sort of at some point uh, uh, making that jump to saying, hey, I think you need to be seen by a specialist. And uh, I think uh, a lot of patients would benefit from that. It's a, it's a very specialized uh, area with a lot, of, uh, a lot of technologies that even like general practitioners may not be um, uh, aware of. And I think uh, it actually behooves a, uh, a person suffering from neck pain to, to at least see what options may be available to them. Okay, thanks. I think that's excellent advice. And uh, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thanks.